Well, hello again. This is Pastor Mark on day, I don't know, it's already been too many of our isolation and even our separation from one another. But we can never be separated from God in his word. And so I'd like to minister to you again from Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 7 this time and going all the way through verse 12. And this is the word of God. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would have not known sin, Paul says. For I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. I think the error that Paul is attacking in these verses can be summed up in a tune. Let me try to sing. Released from the law, O oh blessed condition, I can sin as I please and still have remission. In the middle of Romans chapter 7, I believe that Paul is relating his own experience with the law. And this can be summarized too like this. I fought the law and the law won. So what is the relationship between the law of God and God's gospel? The law prepares us for the gospel by exposing our sin. So why do we need a bloody savior anyway? Well, the law shows us our need for the gospel. The bad news prepares us for the good news. If you're not sick, you won't take the medicine and the law shows you that you're sick, sick with sin. So the law prepares us for the gospel, but then the gospel leads us back to the law as a guide for the Christian life. So the Bible reveals three uses of the law. The law restrains us from sin, the law convicts us of sin, and the law guides us, guides the righteous in the way of life. So the law is sort of like a bulldozer. Um, it levels the ground, prepares the ground so you can build something good upon it. It's sort of rough, ugly, unpleasant work, but it is very necessary. So Paul, I think, is sharing his own spiritual autobiography, what the law did to him. In this section, he relates how the law convicted him, who at that time was a self-righteous Pharisee, of sin. Conviction of sin is what the Puritans called a law work. And this law work is absolutely essential to embracing the gospel. It is really the introduction to grace. Uh, maybe we could put it this way. It is a prerequisite for the class called grace appreciation. You won't appreciate grace until you realize how deeply you have sinned. There are many in the pews today who think that they're pretty good. They're certainly better than most, and God's going to grade on a curve, and they're way ahead of the curve. So they fool themselves on a subtle form of self-righteousness. They think they're good enough. And why? Because they don't know, they don't know their need of Christ. There was a Dr. Gerstner once. He was a bold preacher, and he was visiting in a congregation. He was preaching on sin, and he was preaching against self-righteousness, and he was very bold. And the lady came up to him after the service, and she wasn't there to shake his hand. She said to him, Dr. Gerstner, you make me feel this big. And Gerstner replied, oh, well, that is much too big. That much self-righteousness can send you straight to hell. That's pretty bold. But we must come to an end of ourselves and of our goodness, our self-righteousness, if we're going to find a beginning in the goodness and the grace of God. And the law prepares us for that work like a bulldozer. So the law brings the knowledge of sin. And Paul rejoices in that knowledge of sin. You know, sin for us is something that we would rather hide. And we're kind of ashamed of sin. Uh, but it was Paul's sight of his sin that gave him a view of his Savior. And that made it precious to him. So for Paul, the command not to covet killed him. 
covet, to covet points to what is inside, what is going on in the heart. All the other commandments have an external focus as well. They have an internal focus too, but to command to co not to covet speaks of the intents and the desires of the heart. It's inside of us. It's not something outside of us that we can think we can control. It exposes the motives and the desires of the heart. Someone could say, well, I go to church and I don't swear. Well, I don't swear very much anyway. And I don't have any idols in my living room and I'm okay with God, right? Or they say, I love my family and I don't hurt anybody and I don't sleep around and I don't steal and I don't lie. Well, I don't lie except when I really have to. But in general, I'm a really good kind of guy. But what do you do with that commandment not to covet? What are the motives and intents of your heart? See, this command it internalizes the law. It exposes the heart. It reveals the motives. It is a window through which we can begin to see the spirituality or the full extent of the law. There ain't no way you can hide from that commandment. What's going on inside of your heart? Then, Pastor, well, why are you preaching on conviction of sin? It's really miserable. It's kind of unpleasant. Well, the Word of God does. Uh, and because sin often deceives its victims, sin cries out, peace, peace, where there is no peace. So sin is sort of like a shady used car salesman. He can talk and he can convince you that you're getting a fantastic deal. This car is the best thing since sliced bread. And then when you sign the deal thinking you got a great deal, he still takes you for five grand. Sin is like that, wants to keep on selling us things. And he must be exposed. So without the law, without the preaching of the law of God, the soul-destroying character of sin can hide in the shadows, and he must be exposed. So the law also stirs up sin, Paul says in verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Nothing motivates you like these two words. You can't. You can't do a flip on the tramp. You can't afford that. You can't run faster than I can. You can't exceed the speed limit. Our thirsty desires are like water running downhill. They will go around, squirm around, slither around every barrier to get what they desire. So if you roll a log over in the woods, all the critters scatter for the darkness and the law is what lifts the log. If you shine the flashlight of the law upon the deep recesses of the heart of man, sin will stir to life. And the law slays self-righteousness, verses 10 and 11. You see, sin is the true murderer, not the law. Now, the law may be a gun, but it is the heart that pulls the trigger. The law doesn't kill. Sin kills and then blames the law. Uh, how about this for a story? Uh, my angry neighbor shot my dog. And so I blame the gun companies for not providing safety locks, and I'm suing them for 30 million. Now, why would I do that? Why don't you blame your neighbor for pulling the trigger? Well, he was just mad, and he doesn't have any money anyway. Well, why don't you blame your dog? Oh, he was just chewing on my neighbor's leg. What's the big deal? Plus, he didn't have any money either. So I sue the gun manufacturer. So why did I sue the gun manufacturer? Because I had a vested interest in doing so, uh, and we do too with sin. Let's blame the law. Let's not blame our sin. Or let's blame God. Let's not blame ourselves. Let's never admit that we have a problem. So the law is sort of like your doctor who gives you the bad news that all is not well with you. Ah, take me for instance. My weight and my cholesterol are about the same. For some people that can be good news. For me it is not good news. So I'm mad at the doctor for telling me. It's all his fault. I'm not mad at my diet. I'm not mad at my exercise. I'm mad at the doctor. That's like sinners being mad at the law of God for telling them the truth. That's not very good thinking. So how does the law slay our self-righteousness? Well, it shows you that you are not okay, that you sin, and so do I. It convinces you also that you like it that way. You sin by nature, in other words. And it kills your comfortable self-image. You're not what you think you are.
And it also convinces you that you need help and that you can't help yourself. So you cry out for God because you need him to save you. That's why the law and the gospel are really precious friends. You know why some people belittle the gospel so strongly and reject it so continually? Because they've never heard the law. We're mad at the doctor who brings the truth about our physical condition, and we're mad about the law that brings the truth about our spiritual condition. So Paul ends with the law is holy and it is righteous and it is good. God forbids sin, and remember this, God forbids sin not to prevent us from enjoying ourselves, but to prevent us from destroying ourselves. So the law promotes what is holy and what is just and what is good. The law really is your introduction to the astonishing wonders of grace. So God tears down in order that he might build up. He confronts in order that he might comfort. The law is like a surgeon's scalpel that is intended to heal. This is why Paul could rejoice in the law, because it introduced him to his Savior. And the law can point you in the same direction too.